Right, I think I will make a start now. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Really nice to see you all again. And uh, this is the, the fourth and the final webinar in the series of the IIEDQ workshop on Indigenous Peoples' Food Systems, Biocultural Heritage and the Sustainable Development Goals. Great, so this final webinar is focusing on exploring research methods, interdisciplinary methods and decolonizing methods for research on indigenous people's food systems. So we've had a, a very rich um, discussion in the last three webinars. We've heard from many indigenous experts and I would like to start by highlighting some of the key points that have been made, particularly relating to the priorities for research so we've heard that indigenous people's food systems and biocultural heritage are fundamental for indigenous people's food sovereignty, identity, spirituality, health and well-being, and for everyday life. And that's, um, we heard that they also play a significant role in the transition to sustainable food systems and can make important contributions to economic uh, national economies, as we heard yesterday from Hindu Ibrahim, a pastoralist from Chad. I think a, a key message I've got also is that there's a really strong urgency um, that indigenous food systems face many threats, traditional knowledge is disappearing very fast, and research must focus on these threats and challenges and not only on the indigenous food systems themselves. The threats include restrictions on forest use and resource use, uh, spread of, of modern agriculture and modernization of cultures and inappropriate economic development and also education, Western education systems. The second um, message that I got from yesterday is the critical need to uh, do more research on indigenous people's land rights. As Hindu Ibrahim explained, most land belongs to governments and land that is vital for pastoralists is being sold off to sedentary people and that is a massive threat to their indigenous food system. We heard um, also um, from the uh, representative from the Arctic region of Russia that the introduction of industrial development has almost destroyed their traditional way of life and that traditional food culture of hunting and fishing is very close to nature and that that diet is actually essential for survival in that harsh climate. And that in response to the challenges of climate change, um, they must return to their indigenous food system. And for this, they need to preserve the land. And we learnt that for hunter gatherers in tropical rainforests who are, who are mobile, egalitarian, very culturally diverse, um, they are also facing many threats from economic expansion and from protected areas. So we also heard from, um, from the academic side that land rights is an issue which is under-researched. We heard from Hindu Ibrahim that indigenous peoples don't call it food security, they call it food sovereignty. And this is a priority for research as well as food sovereignty is essential to sustain indigenous knowledge systems. And also she emphasized that maintaining seven generations thinking is really important. Um, not only in Chad, but we also heard that indigenous peoples in China have this seven generation thinking. Hindu also stressed the need to get traditional knowledge respected on the same level as science. And we heard from FAO that um, traditional knowledge contains ancestral wisdom, whereas often science is just information. Frank Roy uh, stressed the need to gather evidence of um, how destructive industrial agriculture is on indigenous peoples, for example, in, in Asia. And he also stressed the need to, for researchers to respect the value of indigenous knowledge um, rather than viewing it as backward as this sometimes happens. And the need to mainstream indigenous perspectives um, in research and to respect indigenous people's rights and the rights enshrined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to support indigenous methods of knowledge transmission like storytelling. And he stressed the need for a multicultural research approach that blends indigenous knowledge and science. And we heard that the multi 
multiple evidence-based approach is one method to do this. We heard that Indigenous peoples would like academics to recognise them as equally expert and that academics can play a useful role in helping to show that Indigenous peoples are experts and that they should support uh, research that is led by Indigenous peoples. Conventional research that is externally led is not useful to Indigenous peoples and can never fully understand them is something that Hindu Ibrahim emphasised. But there's also, um, we also heard that there's much scope for collaboration when there is mutual respect. Um, and um, we heard on the interdisciplinary issue that um, Indigenous peoples don't have separate fields of study, everything is interlinked. So community led research can provide a framework for interdisciplinary research. And we heard that it is crucial to empower in Indigenous communities and to support community networking and to um, also understand the governance um, issues and engage at policy level and that more research is needed on gender and women's health issues. And finally, uh, we heard from FAO about the new global hub on Indigenous people's food systems that brings together universities, UN agencies and Indigenous peoples and seeks to inform policy processes like the, the World Food Systems Summit in, in 2021. And um, uh, just to mention that um, Jon uh, Fernandez de la Linoa uh, from FAO re replied to my question after the webinar because there wasn't enough time, but it, um, he confirmed that UK universities can become members of the hub and that the emphasis is placed on institutions and research centers that are doing hands-on research with indigenous peoples and they're respecting the principle of free prior and informed consent. So for this webinar, we will explore indigenous um, and, and decolonizing research methods, and we'll also explore interdisciplinary research methods. So the first session um, will focus on interdisciplinary methods, methods that draw on more than one discipline uh, to better understand and protect indigenous people's food systems. Um, to enhance the evidence of their importance and to help address the challenges they face. And then after a 15 minute break, we'll look at the, um, we'll have an, a panel um, of Indigenous peoples um, talking about decolonizing and Indigenous research methods that seek to empower Indigenous peoples and help to address the key challenges they face through the research process. So they strengthen culture, Indigenous knowledge, and help to strengthen rights to land and to, to um, strengthen biodiversity, et cetera. So I will hand over to Philippa now. Um, she's going to chair the first session. Um, just to briefly remind presenters that we are a very diverse audience, so please don't use um, academic jargon. And also for the Q&A that follows um, each session today, we would prefer if everybody can raise their hand or use the raise hand function and briefly introduce themselves rather than um, using the chat, but you can use the chat if we run out of time. Okay, thank you so much. I'll hand over to Philippa. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, this first panel um, is on interdisciplinary methods for research on in indigenous and traditional crops, whole food systems and temporal changes. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about combining ethnobotanical and historical approaches. So ethnobotanical approaches to studying indigenous food systems can include documenting crop diversity and uses, the relationships between crops and land use, and between crops and foods. All these elements are connected and subject to dynamic change. There are multitudes of reasons for growing crop varieties, as we all know. Uh, including for different uses such as food or fodder, for their taste and cooking properties, for their resilient traits or yield, and for their suitability to specific moments within seasonal cycles or specific patches of land. So documenting crop diversity and uses within the local agroecological context could include recording which crops are grown in different microenvironments and patches created, for example, by differences in soils or altitude or through land use systems and management such as terracing and, and home gardens. 
in studying crops from cultivation through to cooking practices can include all the practical steps from harvesting through to storage and food preparation and how they connect with material culture, technologies, cultural practices and knowledge. So many crops considered minor today have been more important in the past and documenting farmers' memories can provide valuable information about crop uses, about the advantages of different crops, about growing methods um, that are useful and being forgotten, and reasons for any of these changes. And historical documents and archaeobotanical data can then provide further information on the long-term crop histories and thus insights into their local environmental suitability. So over the past years, I've been collaborating with Sudanese colleagues and Nubian communities studying traditional crops. The project is based in the hyper-arid north, where agriculture is centred on family farms and dependent on the River Nile. So I've got a, a couple of slides to show now um, that introduce my collaborators and some of the farming environments and associated traditional material culture. So I will just... So we interviewed farmers about crops they have grown today and in the past to compare um, their uses and where they are grown. We recorded cultivation and crop processing methods, focusing on cereals and pulses, as well as associated foods. Elderly farmers were also asked how practices have changed with the introduction of new crops and methods, especially since the mid 20th century when traditional um, irrigation systems changed. So several previously staple crops are now minor food crops, and there are many reasons for such changes, including shifts in food preferences and processing methods. And many of these crops are now just grown for home use in small patches, especially along the riverbanks. Today, broad beans are a dominant commercial and food pulse crop, but previously a wide diversity of pulses were eaten more frequently, uh, especially lab lab and cowpea. And baked wheat bread has also become an increasingly dominant food, partly replacing flatbreads, which also used to be made with a wider range of cereal and pulse flours. So changes in crops and foods are also reflected by material shifts, such as the disappearance of many traditional kitchens and storage rooms. And the dominant hybrid crops in use today can only be grown in the winter and are dependent on intensive irrigation, in contrast, the local cultivars of African crops that were dominant in the past are low input and could be grown throughout the year. And these previously important crop species have a long history of use in the archaeological record of the region, helping highlight um, their long-term stories and environmental uh, suitability. So connecting botanical plant identifications and local names is always a key element of ethnobotanical research. And recording the names of crops and types of foods in Nubian, as well as in Arabic, was also important. Some words were more specific in Nubian, and this knowledge is also endangered as it is mostly held within the memories of the older generations and Nubian languages are themselves also endangered. So to help preserve the local agricultural histories, the findings were summarised in a booklet that was shared with local communities and its content and design uh, involved the local community and teachers throughout. I will now um, present a video from my colleague, Mohamed Saad, who discusses our research um, in Sudan further. And Mohamed works at the um, National Museum in Khartoum. Agriculture in the past depend on the symbol system of irrigation, Shaduf as, and Sagia, as well as traditional tools to cultivate and harvest the crops. It is very important to talk to the old people uh, and old farmers about uh, their uh, agriculture because some of them is still they grow the old, all the crops for food in a small area. Because uh, they are important as easy to grow when it is hot. And uh, the main crops is uh, wheat and uh, beans and dates. Uh, also, the old farmers, they have uh, good knowledge, uh, especially about growing crops, seasons, Nile flood. Some change happened uh, when the farmers uh, used the modern system of irrigation. 
and uh, also they use the machine to cultivate their crops. Uh, some farmers they change from uh, food crops to uh, cash crops as well as uh, also the uh, some change happened because people they grow like a big land instead of a small land brilliant thanks and now we're going to move on quickly to uh, raj puri from the university of kent who's going to talk about uh, using ethnobotany and participatory action research to document agrobiodiversity over to you okay uh hello everyone uh, pleasure to be here uh, nice to see you all um, okay, I'm going to try and link these three things um, as best that I can. I don't have any slides, um, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. Okay, ethnobotany then studies the relationship of people to plants, and we think of that relationship as mutual, an interdependency caused by coevolutionary uh, processes that results in what we like to call biocultural diversity. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So our food plants uh, and other cultivated crops are some of the clearest examples of this ongoing coevolutionary process wherein we have manipulated and domesticated these plants and produced this um, agrobiodiversity. But they have also domesticated us and produced the knowledge that we need to grow, protect, harvest, uh, store, and use those plants. And those uses derive ultimately uh, from the material, symbolic, and spiritual needs, beliefs, practices, and values that underpin the cultural lives uh, of peoples around the world. So when we speak of agrobiodiversity, that's only half the story. For what are plant varieties, seeds, and other plant parts without the cultural context and shared knowledges that enliven them and give them meaning? So losing one aspect here necessarily leads to losses in the other. Maintaining crop diversity requires maintaining the recipes for dishes, the celebratory feasts and rituals that require these special varieties. Conserving biocultural diversity, therefore, is a multidisciplinary task requiring integrated research on this coevolutionary relationship, on this biocultural diversity, on its resilience and threats to it, from globalization and climate change, to name just a couple, and on its changing nature culture as it transforms in the face of both internal and external forces and trends of change. So there are many manuals out there and many examples of research of this kind being conducted around the world. I wanted today to focus on participatory action research or PAR, using tested and tried ethnobotanical methods to solve problems, and that, but being conducted by residents of communities who are trying to resolve these problems and develop new directions for their lives and livelihoods. So our role in this is as consultants uh, and trainers, gathering together people to help them think through issues, providing training and perhaps funds to collect and analyze data for themselves, about themselves, uh, helping them to protect, store, and disseminate their knowledge as they see fit now, one fact that we've learned is that no one knows everything about the plants people know and use. And what people do know often differs. There are knowledges of men, of women, of children, of elders, of farmers, of gatherers, of hunters, of fishers. So one important role of an ethnobotanist in PAR is to find ways to get people to share their own knowledge with each other. You know, we can think of great examples, Mark Plotkin's Sorcerer's Apprentice in the 1980s and 90s, trying to get children to learn the traditional medicine of their elders. In Saba, we had a project studying rattan and basketry, and the, the elders of the community set up workshops to teach their children because they realized that they didn't know about basketry, about rattan, and about the plants and dyes that went into it. So we do this through interviewing, for instance, in focus groups of say only older women or only younger men so that they can learn from each other in the process of doing this research. Um, and we do this through community mapping exercises, through inventorying gardens or interviewing along plant trails. All of these can be done by community members. So they may collect specimens and seeds for a community herbarium, 
a garden, or a seed bank, or sit down and write a plant manual in local language for their kids. Or they may choose to record it all on video using what we call participatory video, or PV, uh, developed by our friends at Insight Share. Um, I've been associated with several of these projects over the years, and our students at Kent have been sort of leading the way with uh, their projects engagements with communities to produce gardens, manuals, and videos around the world. Uh, I'd also like to point up the work done by the Global Diversity Foundation, uh, who emphasized long-term commitments to communities to foster, uh, um, foster capacity building so that communities can document their own knowledges. In India, where I've been working recently, Atri researchers have helped communities deal with the impacts of invasive species uh, on forest undergrowth by setting up nurseries to grow some of their important wild food and medicinal plants in their own home gardens. In Saba, GDF led a PAR project with Dusun communities and NGOs to use participatory resource inventory methods uh, to document knowledge and use of plants for the purposes of designing community use zones in the Crocker uh, State uh, Park. All that research uh, and training and their GIS maps that they made themselves became essential and vital when a proposal to dam and flood their valley was dramatically announced. Fortunately, they were successful in killing off this, uh, this idea. So there are other examples I can talk about, and I'm interested to hear from the other panel uh, members what they think. Um, but that's all I have to say, and thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. It was brilliant. Um, we're going to pass over quickly now to Roger Blench. He's going to talk about using ethnobotany, botanical linguistics, and anthropology to understand indigenous food systems. Thanks. Okay, I was ticked off for not having pictures in this slideshow, so you'll just have to put up with text. Sorry about that. Okay, um, I'm not also going to talk about the advertised topic, since, uh, but rather the whole issue of documentation, which is a personal obsession. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the documentation of basic ethnobiological systems remains in a very poor state. And in my view, has in fact deteriorated in the last 40 years. Um, I mean, a lot of discussion at this workshop is about activism, and of course, that is absolutely crucial. But to my way of thinking, activism has to have an evidential base. In other words, you know, it's easy to say uh, we must protect XXXXX, but exactly what are we protecting? That, that's important to understand. There's also a problem of the making useful older documentation. There's a load of older documentation, often in obscure sources or in problematic languages. These are not easily available uh, to present researchers, present activists. So turning older stuff into useful material also seems to me an important priority. Uh, making it accessible and, and something I, I, I mentioned the other day I've been working on, which is turning uh, ethnobotanical stuff into Android applications that people can use on their phones. I also mentioned an important uh, thing, which seems to me, people put out ethnobotanical databases on the internet. Uh, this is mainly because they get grants and they have data and they put it up and it's useful. It is then, of course, unmaintained because the grant finishes and uh, the creator of the project moves on. Um, this goes back, I think, to what FAO was talking about. We have to, to scrape, if you like, all this documentation which people have, have worked hard to prepare and put it in a form that's accessible and interlinked with other sources. So, so there's a lot of stuff to be done on making data available in common formats, which can be consulted by NGOs, by activists, by scientists. So it, so it has a sort of multi-use format. Interdisciplinary research. Well, we've heard a great deal about that, and this is what this section is about. 
Um, my experience of certain organizations, even those represented in this workshop, is that they speak in forked tongues. In other words, you can certainly have a unit that's interested in local information and local cultural practices and useful plants. But at the same time, there are other units in the same body which are interested in promoting hard science and um, publishing papers in nature and science and so on, for whom all this cultural stuff is a load of hooey, frankly. And of course, that's unfortunately where the money is these days. And, and we see this in lots of, lots of disciplines, not only uh, archaeology as well as ethnobotany. There's a problem with funders. Funders like to support advances in individual disciplines. And this makes plant scientists in particular turn away from economic botany. Um, I've talked to many botanists for whom this is all just, you know, fluff, if you like. People publish enormous uh, hardcore botanical surveys of individual countries where not a single mention of even whether plants are domestic or non-domestic, let alone anything to do with uses and local names. Similarly, there's a major problem, I think, with the way information is reviewed in journals. In other words, you know, if you do ethnobotanical documentation of a particular group of people, actually publishing it in, in, a, in a journal is really quite hard. I mean, you can put it out there on the web, and I think that's what a lot of people do. But I think this, this, th there are great difficulties in even getting out uh, basic documentation. I'll give you an example here. I work in Nigeria and I work in Northeast India. In those two places, 502 and two, around 250 languages are spoken. I should say in Nigeria, there are maybe satisfactory ethnobotanical and ethno zoological documentation for maybe four languages and none not one in northeast india and i don't mean you know a list of a couple of plants but i mean a proper solid documentation such as been undertaken in central america so there's a real uphill task a crucial thing in my view is a lack of field guides field guides are essential essential to doing serious ethnoscience, ethnobiology. If you can't even discuss, you can't even discuss the identification of plants and animals with people because you don't have field guide. So even if you are willing, for example, you, you can't easily get uh, you know, a, a chance at identification. Uh, so I just want to, want to emphasize really this absence of field guides and maybe an absence of a data bank of non-copyright photographs which can be used to compile field guides. So I think all these are issues we have to think about. Okay. Brilliant, thank you very much. So we're just gonna stop quickly for um, some questions, which, just can we set my clock? <laughs> Um, so how are we doing? 35. So yeah, if we could just stop for around five minutes of questions, that would be great. Um, has anyone got any questions? They can raise, raise their hand um, or, or put a question into the chat box and then afterwards we'll move on to the, the next uh, round of flash talks. Um, sorry to have a question from me, but just um as nobody raised their hand immediately. Um, thank you very much, all of you. That was really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Roger. Um, I've worked quite a bit on um, protecting traditional knowledge and the main route by which um, biopiracy happens, um, you know, in unauthorized use and commercial use of traditional knowledge is um, through uh, published databases of traditional knowledge. So I was just wondering how you address that issue because obviously this documentation work is important um, and as you say it's really important to have the evidence base to support activism but um, the concern is by making it available that anybody could get their hands on it and abuse you know use it inappropriately 
and without benefits for communities. So I'm just wondering how you address that issue. Thanks. Well, obviously, the first important thing is that you must get consent for dissemination of knowledge from the people you're working with. Um, I have to say, I've never found this a problem in the two areas of the world I work. People love the idea that you know their culture is being disseminated more widely in the world. But these issues certainly have come up in the Amazon, although I do understand it's become less of a problem in more, in more recent times because more companies are less interested in uh, biodiversity chemicals and more interested in, in sort of mechanical processes for developing things. But it remains an issue. And I think the only way around this is to ensure that you definitely have the consent of the community for the dissemination of knowledge. And then what can you do? If it's out there, it's out there. Um, nobody can predict what might, might be found to be useful. Um, so there's, there's, no two way, there's no real way around this as far as I can see. Uh, it's, consent is crucial. Okay, there's a, a question here um, from George McAllister um, about could the speakers share their thoughts on how to undertake participatory action research in a time of COVID, um, perhaps in terms of ethics, tools and practices for building trust and, and capacity for, for community-led processes? Raj, I think this might be for you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good question. Very difficult. Uh, in fact, we just submitted a grant to the ESRC here in the UK to try and get funding to do just that when it was uh, shot down as being uh, one of the comment, one of the viewers said that uh, they wondered if it was unethical to interview the same family three times in a year. So that just goes to show you <laughs> perhaps who's reviewing these, these proposals. But our, our goal there was to uh, work in pre -existing, with pre-existing relationships we have with a couple of communities in London and Birmingham uh, already. So making use of pre-existing networks and getting members of the, the communities that we were interested in, Afro-Jamaican, Afro-Caribbean communities and uh, South Asian communities um, to do research amongst their own people, amongst their own neighbors and families to kind of get a sense of how they were uh, reacting to COVID-19 in terms of their use of uh, traditional healing methods, self-care, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, the way to do it really is again, through good, uh, and close rapport building and close relationships with pre-existing um, uh, networks in the case of COVID-19. Starting something brand new might be a bit difficult. Um, we note, I was also part of an online survey and we noted that very few uh, members of the South Asian or the Afro-Caribbean community were answering online surveys about what they were doing during COVID-19. And uh, it was clear that that's why ethnographic research, um, as, as much as you could do in terms of face-to-face -face interviewing, whether it's by Zoom or telephone or WhatsApp or on the doorstep, was really important. You know, people uh, from minority groups often uh, are just um, either don't have linguistic or, or digital capabilities for uh, talents for using those kinds of online surveys. I don't know. I hope I hope that answered some of your question. <laughs> yeah, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks so, much. Uh, if I can contact you outside of this uh, forum, that would be wonderful. Thanks. Oh yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. There's a, a, a few comments here in the in the chat. Um, it's a bit. I'm just reading Harriet's. Okay, so that, that might be something that someone else could, is there anyone could answer, answer that question? But I, I think we also need to, to move on um, with the team. Christina, what's, what's the best way to, to carry on answering some of the questions here if we need to get going with the, the talks? Would it be good for people to just send a couple of replies into the chat? Yes, I think that would be the best. Um, while we move on, if you, if you could reply to the question in the chat, I think. Cool, well, anyway, we better move on. Um, so the next um, round of talks is still talking about more different sort of inter multidisciplinary methods. Um, 
And so we're going to start now with Paul Wilkin from Kew, um, who's going to present on botanical science for conserving orphan crops and indigenous knowledge. Over to you, Paul. Well, as if that isn't a big enough task for three minutes, I also thought I would say that the comments I'm about to make also cover niche crops and wild, ex wild exploited plant resources really across the whole spectrum uh, of domestication. I think what we're talking about in terms of botanical science boils down to four key questions. We've already started to touch on some of those. The first one is, what is it? Inventory is, is, is a critical part, so species, uh, land races, farms, varieties, but also looking at in particular at trait variation uh, and in current uh, research approaches, we also want to look at genetics and genomics as ways of describing and understanding the diversity that we're seeing in front of us. And we want to see participatory shared and restored knowledge within that context. The next key question is where is it? We want to geolocate the material we're looking at and that brings into play a whole load of spatial research methods that I'm not going to talk about today because we don't have time. And then once we've done those preliminary steps and, and those are the two most critical first steps, then we start to think about conservation. Uh, conservation is vital, we are all aware of that and, and the, the population of the globe is increasingly aware of that. Uh, so first we would look at in situ methods of conservation, we'd look at cultivation either in situ or close to in situ, and then once those methods are exhausted we'd move to ex situ methods, in particular around seed banking or cryopreservation, uh, and all of those are the suite of approaches that are open to us to make sure that we have access to, to the relevant germplasm. Uh, and then the bit which is often forgotten, the part on the end, uh, is what do we do with the conserved material? How do we regenerate plants from that and how do we get them back where they're needed? So uh, we, we'd be wanting to look at things like seed germination ecology uh, and the uh, extraction of cryopreserved material and regeneration of it as, the, as critical approaches to delivering the, the plant resources that people need. I think I will leave it at that. Thank you, Paul. Um, I was wondering as well if you could just say something really briefly on um, maybe how there's different approaches for different categories of crops. So, for example, the, the seed crops like cereals versus the vegetative vegetative crops. From um, a conservation perspective, you mean, Philippa? For many of the steps one to three, really, for the in situ for the in situ work or or characterising so, it. Evidently, uh, seed bearing crops like cereals are relatively easy uh, to bank. Uh, crops which are based on underground organs, which are vegetatively propagated, are much harder to conserve. Uh, they usually require uh, germplasm collections, which are expensive to maintain and often uh, find it very difficult to retain information associated with the accessions in those collections. Uh, so they're often two or three years down the line are often quite worthless. Uh, and then you end up resorting to cryo approaches, which are extremely expensive uh, and technical and difficult to, to uh, approach, but, but may be the vital way of preserving. So IITA in, in Nigeria uh, conserves much of its yam diversity through cryo because it's the only approach that works. Okay, thanks. And now and we're gonna briefly explain just, what cryo is, a, a lot of technical a, jargon a, coming through, thank you. Right. Yeah, I forgot tissue culture, which is another way to, to conserve material. Cryopreservation, so freezing of, of embryos uh, down at very low temperatures, and then they can then be, re plants can be regrown uh, from those preserved embryos. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to move on to, um, where am I? <laughs> to Tiziana Union from Kew, who's going to talk about using plant diversity and ethnobotany to support community livelihoods. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Philippa. I'm going to share my screen. I have a slide. Yeah, okay. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Um, so um, I'm going here to uh, talk about uh, um, our research method through the project, the Use to Plan project that I've been coordinating for several years. Um, this is a project uh, um, that was developed and carried out in Africa and also Latin America. So um, we, uh, the aim of this project was to 
um, basically conserve ex situ indigenous useful plants, uh, those ones that uh, were important for local community, uh, by building actually the local capacity to successfully conserve and uh, use them. Uh, so the main components uh, of the project uh, can be summarized as it follows. So we have one part of targeting and prioritizing the species. So by using different methods. So one hand we did, uh, of course, literature review to see what was already available there. On the other hand, we are being really carrying out ethnobotanical surveys um, by working directly with the local community. Uh, but uh, at the end, we had really to come up uh, with um, a short list of most important species where we can we could focus um, and uh, on and do uh, really our um, conservation and sustainable use activity. And we did this through a workshop, participatory workshop. Um, then another component has been on the seed conservation. So seed conservation. Um, was applied to uh, the priority species. And we did the seed conservation together with local community and with our collaborators in country by collecting and uh, uh, storing the seeds. Then we uh, have been um, propagating those seeds in order to have them available, um, not, um, not only for research, but of course uh, for the community. In a way, in this way, we establish community garden, but also forestry plots in the case of, uh, of Kenya, where we've been propagating uh, this priority and cultivating the species. And lastly, um, we have been developing methods uh, um, and uh, uh, in order to create some income in the community uh, through the um, selling of uh, plants directly, seedling, but also plant product, uh, in particular food product. Well, food, um, product. So how did we do all of this? Well, we apply a participatory approach, as I said, by working together with the community from the beginning to the end, um, and also reaching out uh, to other stakeholders uh, by involving um, them in our activities and in our products. Our approach uh, was also multidisciplinary, uh, as we carry out different kinds of research. We carry out ethnobotanical research, but also we carry out research on sea biology and ecology to inform both the management of the seeds, but also the conservation of the seeds, and how to propagate those seeds. And then we develop propagation protocol, and we also establish some um, agricultural plots in order to look at the growth rate and the survival of these species. Um, so to conclude, uh, um, what did we do with all this information? Well, the one that also we generated, we, give, we gave it back to the local community through training, but also we help enhancing the local activities. Um, and also we summarize all our, um, all our information in, the, in a book that you can see on, uh, here on, um, on the corner on the right. And uh, we produce this book, so, um, which is a well plan for a sustainable future. We uh, compile all the information that we collected from the community, our own information that we generated through the research, and try to condense it in this, in this book, where we have uh, uh, in there ethnobotanical information, we have other sort of botanical information, species description, so that people can identify the species. Um, that's something that came out earlier in the talk. But at the same time, how to know how to uh, deal with the species from a conservation and sustainable um, uh, use point of view. So uh, this is a book that is aimed to practitioners um, in country, um, um, but also um, that they work in development outside, uh, with the aim really to help them use the species and conserve them. Um, in a way that can help addressing uh, community livelihoods and conservation at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, much. Really. Um, so we're going to move on to um, Julian. Uh, Julian Gary Vasquez, who's going to talk about identifying archaeobotanical evidence for plant processing techniques. Um, yeah. it's me, Over to you. So basically, I am a PhD student at University College London, and I do archaeobotanical analyses to understand human plant dynamics in uh, of indigenous communities in the Caribbean through archaeological methods. And one of the things that I realized is that 
through archaeobotany, um, you know, we can identify many types of plants um, from the archaeological record. However, um, at times, we don't understand how to process them because, as, as has been said in the in the workshop, that there's um, indigenous knowledge that gets lost. However, I am here to kind of like contra repose and the reality is that it's not lost. Our ancestors have this information um, in the in the archaeological records. You know, they are the bearers, the custodians of this information that got lost and we can work using archaeobotanical methods to bring it back to the present. And this image is just um, one of the activities that I do to understand the, how the different methods of processing manioc, which is here. <laughs> um, and this also helps not just, you know, going through the motions of actually cooking the dish, which is cassava bread, um, which you can see here, um, but also it helps you understand how those things get to the archaeological record. And the way that I do this type of revitalization of indigenous food practices is by using collection of carbonized plant remains and then from those there are fragments which look like food or are especially also um, tuber fragments um, and using um, scanning electron microscope you can potentially identify those foods but beyond the simple identification of species or what type of food it is you can actually try to assess um, food uh, taste preferences and actually, if this type of research is done on a more larger scale, you can try and start getting a sense of contextualizing the food habits of people. Um, and that's something that I am trying to work on throughout my work. And not and as, as I said before, revitalizing indigenous fr uh, food practices, which is this image, which is from the Taino New Year celebration in my island of Borigen. Thank you so much for that. And it's really, really great to really love um, seeing all of those images as well. We were all getting hungry already. Um, <laughs> um, and now we will talk about long term um, crop histories, the archaeobotany of crop histories. So passing over to Dorian Fuller from UCL. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm an archaeobotanist like uh, Julian, who you just heard from. Um, Archaeobotany is the study of the preserved plants from ancient human sites. So it's the archaeology of plants instead of the archaeology of pottery or some other kind of artifact. Uh, and it can inform us about the long-term history of crop repertoires within a region. So which crops have come into use and out of use over the long term. Uh, it can tell us about ancient changes and diversification in crops. Uh, it often tells us about within a particular region how much of an impact the post-Columbian exchange has been between crops uh, from the New World and Old World being uh, shifted around. Uh, and we heard, you know, you will find maize in parts of Asia and Africa being very important. And that's, of course, a change that's happened within recent centuries. Uh, it can also tell us about lost crops, or what we might call orphaned crops, or crops that are disappearing. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today with a few examples. And I've listed some there in red. And I'm going to quickly walk you through, walk you through kind of three uh, stories about lost or disappearing crops that archaeology can tell us about that you might not otherwise expect uh, to learn very much about. Um, so it's something that can um, in a sense, complement the kind of ethnobotanical documentation that we've been talking about. So the first of those that I'd like to talk about is brown top millet, or Brachiaria ramosa. And this is really the lost staple grain of South India, of the Deccan region. Uh, now, it's not completely lost. There is a region in northwestern Tamil Nadu and adjacent Karnataka where it is grown on a very small scale, or at least it was still grown in the 1990s on a very small scale. The last documented reference to this I know of is from a paper published in Economic Botany in the year 2000 by a Japanese scholar and some Indian colleagues. And they documented, I think, two villages. 
that grew this crop that uh, in the late 1990s. And I have a picture there of a map that shows the region where that modern cultivation was and some of the dishes and breads that were made out of this millet, most of which were kind of ritual food. So it was maintained mainly for particular festivals. But the area highlighted in blue, broadly speaking, is and all those dots are where we have archaeological evidence for this as a grain. Uh, and often as the dominant grain, the staple grain on many of those sites. So for, from around four and a half thousand years ago up until maybe 1500 years ago, this was in many regions a staple food. So it is very much declined as a millet. And that's a story that we can only learn about through the archeological evidence, which then tells us that it was suitable and much more of much more widespread importance. And what remains in recent times is just a, you know, a small sample of its past uh, diversity and cultural use. Uh, another example of crops that are uh, completely lost to us in the ethnographic present are some of the examples of North American domesticates. Uh, and there, there are very, two very well ex uh, documented examples are a lost kinopodium. So this is a pseudo cereal similar to modern quinoa, but a separate North American species. And I also Iva annua oil seed, and I've got pictures there of Iva annua seeds. It's distantly related to sunflower. Archaeological evidence shows that it undergoes domestication, so it get, you get a larger seeded variety, so-called macrocarpa variety. Now this variety does not exist today. There's no living biological versions of it. It only exists in the archaeological record. Um, but it's a fairly major crop, an oil seeded crop that's cultivated in this Mississippi basin from about from more than 4,000 years ago up until mm -hmm. at least 1,000 years ago, probably later. We don't really know when it goes extinct as a crop. And I would guess that it's around the time of European contact when you have such a large uh, decimation of native populations due to European diseases. Um, uh, so uh, again, it, it's something that has potential, but it, it's lost to our kind of ethnographic documentation. Uh, and then the third case I'd like to give is one that would seem like a crop we know a lot about, wheat. Um, but in fact, there's a lot of kinds of wheat that we don't really know very much about. Um, today, uh, one thing to note is that wheat comes in lots of different genetic types as several species of wheat, really. Today, most of the wheat we eat and most of what's cultivated is either bread wheat or durum wheat. Durum wheat is, is cultivated, especially in the Mediterranean, to make pasta and couscous. But these are really quite recent phenomena, these two species of wheat that dominate. So they start to really become important in the Roman period, about 2,000 years ago, and in places like Britain, maybe only 1,000 years ago. And prior to that, there's a real diversity of wheat species, and I've kind of circled them there with different colors. Durian, I have to just wrap up quickly for the okay. last... I need 30 seconds more. And the one point I would say is that there's two varieties here, which I've highlighted in uh, two gray nine corn. I've, there's, a, there's a green arrow pointing to it. And this Triticum timophivi, there's a purple arrow pointing to it, which are really dominant species in the Neolithic and Bronze Age and have basically gone extinct since then. So we can see that um, the wheat diversity around us today and used traditionally uh, is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily reflect the long term. So archaeology can reveal these patterns of long term change. And that's what I want to say. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, cool. So now we're going to um, present a video uh, from Matthew Davis at UCL, who will be talking about documenting traditional crops, agri systems, and temporal changes in Kenya. Uh, m many apologies that I cannot be with you today as I'm teaching and thanks for indulging me in this opportunity to record a short film. My name is Dr Matthew Davis and I work at the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College London and most of my research has focused on how people manage agricultural landscapes in Eastern Africa and I'd briefly like to introduce a long-standing multidisciplinary research project that has examined food systems in Marraquet in northwest Kenya. This is led by a number of co-investigators, including the PI Professor Henrietta Moore, Dr. Wilson Kip Corey from the University of Eldoret, Professor Jacqueline McGlade from Strathmore University and from UCL, 
and Dr. Sam Lund Rockcliffe from UCL, who should be with you all today. It also includes multiple East African partners, including the East Africa Herbarium and the British Institute in Eastern Africa. Now, Marraquet is a rural area that straddles the eastern side of the Cario Valley. It's well known for its extensive pre-colonial irrigation systems, and our research project has a deep history led by Professor Moore with some continuity go back, going back into the 1970s, and including work by Kenyan scholars such as Ben Kipkoria, J. Senyonga, S. Muticio, and Wilson Kipkore, as well as researchers including Bill Adams, Liz Watson, and Tom Dietz. Throughout, our research has intersected with food systems and has often taken these as the central focus. But it's also important to note that the work has also focused on many other related issues, particularly broader development interventions, such as this Red Cross irrigation scheme and wider processes of ecological management. A key tenet of our research over the last decade has been to develop community-led research through citizen scientists who are community members and who, who help determine the research questions, methods and analyses. This citizen science team is led by Mr. Timothy Kipkeo Kipruto and Ms. Helena Chepto, pictured here on the left, with one of our key team members, Nelson Balilengo, on the right. Research into food systems by this team has thus always been embedded in wider social, economic and environmental agenda, often defined by the priorities of the citizen scientists and the community itself, rather than by strict singular research questions. For example, lines of research have examined failed histories of development interventions, many of which have been agricultural in nature, but many of which also have not. A primary aim of this work has thus been to build a detailed history of the community, the agricultural landscape, the rural economy and its wider connections uh, to food production, which necessarily form a core aspect of this. The methods employed have been diverse, but often rooted in different ways of mapping and knowing the wider landscape and embedding analyses of things, plants, animals, pathways, networks, buildings and interventions within this landscape. So this work has included everything from traditional archaeological field survey to surveys of colonial and post-colonial structures and interventions, combined with multiple forms of ethnographic observation and interview, spanning both ethno-historical and contemporary topics. Particular attention has been paid to physically uh, but, uh, to physically mapping with GPS and GIS the landscape led by the citizen science team, including mapping contemporary and historic features in relation to food production, settlement patterns, field boundaries, irrigation, terracing, erosion, buildings, and other structures. Participant-led mapping has planned individual fields, as you can see here, including their boundaries, routes, pathways, and allowing for detailed in situ ethnographic interviews of what farmers produce, where, when, how, and in what combinations. Repeat mapping of nearly 100 film, uh, fields over the last eight years in particular has not only provided quantitative data on the types and combinations of crops, both indigenous and hybrid, but also for deeper conversations about decision-making and innovative experimentation. Work on ethnobotany has thus been extensive, including identifying the complex use of some different 10 varieties of sorghum and 12 landrace varieties of finger millet. But we've always situated these in wider systems of food production through time and always focused on the intersection of both indigenous landraces and more hybrid crops. Most recently, we've worked on georeferenced smartphone data recording of interviews, features and photographs and have developed with farmers bespoke data collection applications using a software called Sapelli that allows farmers to record cropping practices and associated challenges. Although these data are still being collected and are still under analysis, this has resulted in some 29 major cultivated crops being um, identified, both new and old with some 36 wild food plants. And these are used in literally hundreds of unique combinations. Overall then, although this work has documented indigenous food production, the aim has not been to focus solely on the heritage of this, but rather to try to place diverse food production systems within a complex narrative of change and continuity through time and space. And to situate this within contemporary food debates, such as those surrounding the notion of an African green revolution. 
our aim, I think, has been particularly to help smallholder holder farmers show how diverse their practices and influences are and to situate their heritage alongside the dynamic use of modern materials, ideas and experimentation. So in short, then, I think this our work has been about rethinking the distinctions between traditional and modern practice, between continuity and innovation, and to recenter smallholder farmers uh, as sources of rather than as the recipients of innovation. So I hope that this uh, quick talk has not been too brief and too confused, but I thank you all very much for listening and uh, hope to hear feedback and questions through the grapevine. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thanks. When we move on to um, questions after, I think you could all see the, the comment from, from Sam here in the chat. Um, so Sam's with us today, so he can address um, questions. And he's also posted a, a longer version of that video. Um, so now we're gonna move on to, to Sandeep Hazara Singh from Open University, who's gonna talk about oral history as a method for studying um, the meaning of food waste in India. Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. Uh, so this, this talk is based on recorded and filmed oral history interviews with women smallholders in Karnataka, India, in the context of a recent AHRC funded collaborative project called Changing Farming Lives in South India, Past and Present. Uh, from this experience and in the context um, of our discussion of food systems and heritage, oral history might provide a particularly amenable entry point for research. This is because oral history is about memory and remembering lived experience. It can therefore document and communicate food traditions and heritage and the meanings and feelings involved in a particularly vivid manner. Secondly, food tends to resonate particularly well with memory in terms of its sensorial ability to trigger rich memories and emotions of food pleasures within home, family, and community. This process is known as edible memory. Thirdly, this method offers the capability of generating insights into meanings of food cultures over a significant historical duration. Um, and it is also, finally, conducive to reclaiming the voices and life experiences of indigenous and subaltern groups, such as women peasants and farmers, who tend to be marginalized in written documents. Uh, Oral history essentially involves the process of co-creation between interviewer and narrator in a way that both highlights narrator agency and invites listeners or viewers into her lived experience. Uh, very often in development writings, the voices of subaltern groups tend to be subsumed by the researcher's interpretation which is what ultimately becomes authoritative. Uh, in our project, uh, we began by asking questions that of course were primarily of interest to us as researchers, uh, but participants were encouraged to shape their narratives as much as they wished by talking about food crops, uh, food activities, other subjects and life episodes that they themselves regarded as significant and meaningful. In the process, uh, we discovered that it was foods and diets that the women smallholders were particularly passionate about, um, especially the beliefs, rituals, and knowledges associated with finger millet-based foodways that they were seeking to revive. Uh, rituals involved deities, earth, seeds, animals, birds, and other more than human entities which have the power to affect food and farming outcomes. Um, in contrast, they were much less interested in the economic specificities of crops and livelihoods. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, I would say that oral history offers the capacities to understand and change the present in the light of the past, to identify patterns of local social and climate change, to give voice to hidden and alternative narratives, 
And finally, to recall cultural memories as a repository of knowledge and resilience for ongoing innovations. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. That's brilliant. Um, and uh, so we've just got one last uh, video now um, from Harriet Kulang, um, who some of you might remember from Monday. Um, and she's talking about participatory methods for exploring indigenous food systems, health and well-being. Uh, thank you for including me in this segment of the of the program that you have developed there at Q and IIED. I'm very happy to be with you to be talking about participatory methods to explore indigenous people's food systems, health and well-being. So my experience is through the Center for Indigenous Peoples Nutrition and Environment at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where I was founding director from 1985 until 2009, and I'm still active in promoting the center, as which is really why I'm here today. So I have to give credit to many, many people who worked through the center over the years and our community collaborators, um, not only for the data that we have provided and the many publications, but also for building the strategies for community consultation. When we started our work with the center, we had the indigenous leaders in Canada guiding us on how to have proper community consultation. And in fact, they even lobbied uh, for funding with the Canadian government to help establish the center. So we're very grateful to them, in particular to Chief Bill Erasmus from the Dene Nation. So our work uh, in the Canadian Arctic during that period of time led to many publications, uh, but I want to call your attention to this publication that uh, was requested from the WHO. Uh, this was published in 2003 in English and Spanish. It's on the uh, CINE website as well as the WHO website, Indigenous Peoples and Participatory Health Research, Planning, Management, and Preparing Research Agreements. So we learned that there is no one single way to build collaboration. Every community is different, but there are a few key principles uh, that I'd like to call your attention to. First of all, you have to listen. You have to learn, know how to carefully listen to your collaborators in the communities for their concerns, for their ideas on how to do things right from their perspective. So that means you have to maintain a respect for the people and that helps them respect you. You need respect for the food system, the environment and work uh, to continue to build mutual respect for mutual benefit. So that leads to the important concept of trust. You can't get anywhere in community work uh, with research or development without having mutual trust with your community. So one of those principles means you're working with them. You're not working on them. You're not working on nutrition, on the people in X community. You're working with them. So I also call your attention to the 2016 publication from FAO on free prior and informed consent. And please always recognize that you need collective as well as individual consent in the research processes. And along the line, uh, always keep in mind that when we as academics prepare our publications, it is very important for the community partners to know about them, to participate in them, to be co-authors, and to have these publications returned to them so that they can be translated if appropriate for the community members. I think that's all I have time for. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, now we, we, I think we're doing, we're perfectly on time, which is amazing. Um, so we can have some uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'm just trying to get my speaker view back on. Great. So has anyone got any questions for anyone? Um, raise, you can raise your, your hand or put questions in the chat. 
Excellent. So I, I see quite a lot of comments in the, the chat box, but I think they're, I haven't been able to follow those doing all of this. So I think they're from the previous discussion. So does anyone have any questions for the um, recent speakers of the flash talks? Lucas. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Pavera, and I'm a researcher combining ethnobotanical and nutritional approaches. And with the Indigenous Partnership and Mr. Frank Roy, who is present, we are uh, working on indigenous food systems in Indonesia, Northeast India, and also a bit in Ethiopia and Mexico, Yucatan. And uh, I would like to uh, mention the presentation of uh, Dr. Tiziana Ulian, which was, I think this livelihood aspect is becoming more and more important. And as we can see, many indigenous cultures and also the food systems are under pressure and changing from the intensification and livelihood needs and also cash crops coming. So I think the livelihood aspect is really that something that should be strengthened. Uh, but what we found is quite a challenge is how do we balance the trade-off between livelihood and commercialization and also own consumption. For example, in uh, Indonesia or Northeast India, our studies are showing that uh, farmers are producing nutritious food groups such as eggs or fruits, but then they rather, you know, sell them because of the income opportunities, which a little bit compromise the diets and dietary diversity in the end. So, you know, how do we balance this, this trade-off between livelihood and own consumption? That would be my question. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lucas, for your very interesting question. He's actually a key question. And I think, um, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very important in terms of development and how to carry out a sustainable development. Uh, as you are mentioning, uh, the problem is that um, you can support livelihood, that you can help uh, commercializing one species, uh, but how can we stop by, um, uh, somehow how can bring the benefit into the community? Uh, it, it's key and actually it needs to be involved into the value chain of that product. Um, of course, uh, um, again, this needs to be multidisciplinary and also involve different stakeholders. Um, it's important to have uh, uh, even um, uh, some, uh, um, like a, a, at the country level, some legislation that, uh, um, in a way that this need, it, it's incorporated into the legal framework of the country, uh, because otherwise you need to, to protect this product. And actually, more in the value chain, you have a middle dealer, and more likely, um, less likely you're going to benefit the local community. Uh, so it's, it's really a big problem. And I think it's something that, um, we're always being uh, aware uh, through our work and through our research. And uh, for this, we've been really working directly with the local community and, and also with NGO, because NGO somehow they are um, the voice uh, in general of the local community and they really can help us in uh, bringing uh, the commercialization um, from the community to uh, the national, regional level, and national level and potentially at the international level. So this is definitely a key step in order to support uh, livelihood that they need to be addressed. And this, again, it needs to be in the interdisciplinary and the same, at the same time to have a multi um, participatory approach, not only at the research level, but also by linking up with, uh, um, with the um, local government and national government at the same time. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. Um, oh, so I've got a couple of questions here. Paul's in the chat first and then on to, to Roger. So how widespread is the pattern of farmers selling production to the detriment of their nutrition? Sandy, do you have any comments on that? Um, I think the, uh, the women farmers we spoke to actually very keen on uh, the nutritional aspects of uh, the foods uh, they, were, they were seeking to revive. Um, they were kind of very aware that uh, it was particularly important to know, to, to grow known foods and that there was no benefit in uh, consuming foods from the outside, as they put it, which they did not know. So this issue of knowledge um, of foods was, was particularly important. Um, and they were able to tell us in detail in, in, in uh, 
in, in a considerable way the uh, nutritional properties of uh, foods like uh, the, the various millets which uh, they were growing um, and, 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 and the various properties of the seeds they, they, they were saving and exchanging uh, as well. Um, That's, that's brilliant, thanks. Um, I remember something from some of my interviews as well, that just things like the qualities of taste could change when certain crops grown for, for food were grown in different qualities of soils. And it's that very sort of precise local knowledge. And so sometimes you could have the same crop being grown in some different soils for purposes of selling that crop or for using it for animal fodder. Then the same crop and the same like land race being grown in a different patch of better quality soils when it was being um, used to eat at home. So, and it, that sort of knowledge was being lost sort of locally as well. Um, so Roger, you had a, a question as well. Good. Um, I've been a surprised. This conference is sort of entitled Indigenous Food Systems. There's been extraordinarily little discussion of cookery itself and and you know actual actual ways that people think about preparing different foods now in itanagar in the capital of arunachal pradesh one of the fascinating things are the tribal food restaurants that's what they call themselves there are many different ethnic groups in uh, 52 in arunachal pradesh many have their own quite specific cuisines and they have a restaurant system which has grown up to serve people who want to eat those particular foods. Uh, I, there is, you know, th this sort of thing also happens a bit in Nigeria and uh, quite a lot in Indonesia, where in Indonesia, any big city has uh, restaurants which serve people from different islands in Indonesia. I feel these are grossly understudied. In other words, these are some of the institutions, these commercial restaurants, which are acting to propagate indigenous food systems. In other words, they're the people who, who, who make money from actually selling people the food they really like to eat. And uh, to, to my knowledge, I've seen very little or no study of any sort of these, these restaurant systems and how they act to in pr promote indigenous foods. Has anyone else got any um, comments on that, Raj? Yeah, I, I was going to say thank you, Roger. That's a very good point. I've, I think recipes and dishes and cookery is extremely important. We've had students looking at the uh, reintroduction of wild plants into these kinds of restaurant cuisines in Malaysia, for instance, in Singapore. And because of COVID-19 here in London in Malaysian restaurants uh, and uh, looking also that, that these places are also venues to revitalize traditional crops and traditional plant, um, plants in cooking uh, as, a, as also a way to kind of present that traditional food tradition. Yeah, um, Philip, I also wanted to <laughs> add on that. Uh, yeah, I think it's extremely important to, re to record the recipe and it's somehow a way to conserve the way in, in the same way you conserve the recipe or conserving the traditional knowledge, you are conserving the species as well. And I wanted to mention that um, we have recently started a project on the Mediterranean diet uh, in Lebanon and Jordan. And we identify uh, some species that actually you can find in the, um, in the, Lebanese restaurant in Lando, you know, they really consider a delicacy at, uh, at the country level and really, really appreciate them. So uh, the work we are doing is really trying to bring these other species, some are harvested from the wild, some are cultivated, and we're also looking into the nutritional content of the species, uh, looking at the micronutrients uh, in order to, to look at the health benefit and at the same time, by looking at the health benefit, you can, this information can help to promote uh, uh, these species that are minor in the cuisine somehow, or what we know outside, but they're still very important at the local level. That's brilliant. Ju Julian, did you have your hand up before? One of the things is that, um, yes, I agree with Rog Roger Blench and Raj. And the thing is that, Another 
to mention, I just forgot to mention, is that, um, you know, we've been talking about plant and seed collections and all these types of things, but also one of the things that I do in order to be able to inform and like identify foods from the archaeological record is that I have a food library, not just of the recipes, but actually pieces of the food, because, um, you know, you can have the recipes, you can have all these things, but if you don't know how does the product really look, um, and that also helps you inform and understanding how does these types of like um, the the way that the method conditions the type of behavior that the remain will have. So that's another thing that you can actually be doing. You have been, you know, I, I know that every time you go to the field work, you are like, oh, here, eat this, eat that. And then you can just try and build up also a food reference collection, which would be, it's, it's one of the important aspects. So I think it's, Oh, I've, I've got one quick comment. So, like as archaeobotanists, we're always interested in those stages of, of processing. And I think one thing we're looking at changes in the last 50 years that so sort of research Sandeep's been doing with uh, looking at um, grinding stones and moving to modern methods. And the same in, in Sudan is that sometimes the change in cooking practices or use of crops is, is linked to these changing material cultures. and so one, one interest in our, our project is looking from farm through to, to plate to try and capture all those interconnected processes. So Alex, you had, you had a, a question. Um, yeah, so I, hi, I'm Alex. I'm at the UCL Institute of Archaeology and Archaeobotanist. I also intern for Q. Um, I grew up on um, coastal Miwok land in Northern California. I'm in communication a lot with a lot of native tribes in California through different dialogue groups, what Chumash, Serrano, Washu, Miwok. And um, something that we talk a lot about is reconnecting with traditional recipes and how do we support indigenous groups who have been forced out of practicing traditional food systems and the increased rise in this. I don't, I don't really hear a lot of discussions um, with traditional Native Americans in North America. Um, a lot of people have, are in urban settings or on reservations, but there is an increased interest with the rise of like Indigenous Peoples Day, which was this past Monday, um, as a replacement for Columbus Day, with a desire to reintegrate traditional food systems, even though they the origins of a lot of American food systems are actually like in the narrative, like Thanksgiving. How do we support communities of people who are, have had broken indigenous condition, traditions? Because a lot of my friends who are Miwok or Ohoni want to practice these recipes. They want to reintegrate a corn flour into the dialogue. They want to integrate traditional like, you know, um, fishing practices, but they don't have any resources <laughs> to do that and so but there is an increased commercial interest in it like the Sioux cookbook has picked up and has won a national award and so there is like an increasing fascination with Native American cuisines but there's next to no support so I don't know I don't know I just wanted to bring this into the dialogue and I wanted to um, kind of introduce a North American perspective just because they're often um, not included in the dialogue. Does anyone have any comments on that? Um, and there's, yes. there's actually some related comments now in, in the chat as well. But, so, and then we're going to have to move on to a break, I think. Um, look at Gary Nabhan's work uh, on food networks and food sovereignty in the southwest and uh, west of the United States. Food heritage systems and uh, trying to reclaim traditional food, um, uh, food ways. Um, can, can I also mention that way back in the end of the 19th century, the good old Smithsonian used to produce wonderful books about indigenous cookery systems in North America, books which are long out of print. But in my view, you know, people should have a look at these because they, they documented food and cookery systems at a time when they were pretty well intact. I mean, I collected a few of these in myself, but but, you know, but, it seems but how are these being resource. distributed to communities? Because my my friends I talk to don't know these exist. Slash, they're often really hesitant to engage with this literature because it was often written by colonists. 
And so there's an apprehension to engage. Is there access to resources that have been written by Indigenous scholars? Because that's the biggest comment I get from people I talk to is how do I access modern day resources written by Indigenous ecologists or people who have a comprehensive understanding and it's not through a colonial narrative? Because I know people who know the Smithsonian stuff, but they don't want to read it because it's automatically comes from a perspective that doesn't have a full appreciation. That's, this is just, I'm just regurgitating news. I've, I've been told to spread from my communities, so yeah. Well, I, I think that's really unfair. I've read this stuff and, and these were, ex at least you, you need to look at them and read them and see, are, are they realistic and so on? I mean, you know, of course, maybe there is some colonial perspective, but give them a chance. Don't just throw them out of the, the pram or automatically. I mean, it's, it's something that we have to, to deal with with a lot of archival material from, from these periods and the historical research methods take, take those sorts of biases into consideration so you could try and abstract the information but in the context of those materials. But Sandeep would be able to, to better comment on whether I've got that sort of correctly phrased. Uh, well, yeah, yes, if, uh, if you're looking for kind of indigenous or subaltern voices uh, within, within, the, uh, within the archive, especially the colonial archive, uh, you're likely to, to look in vain. But nonetheless, within that, there are, um, even the colonial archive required um, reliance on uh, native and indigenous informants. So kind of a, a way of reading the archives, as has been called, against the grain, will kind of give you some perspectives from the people who provided the colonialists with the information. So it's kind of a fine reading the archives and being alive to the kind of the silences, the dissonances, the information that is coming to uh, the colonial author, um, and which is sometimes actually acknowledged. So yes, you would not get kind of a, a, clear, um, a clear outline of views directly by indigenous or subaltern groups, but there is a way of making sense of of the archives. They're not completely, uh, I would say, useless. And maybe that's the role of modern uh, day I'm afraid academic. we're going to have to stop now. Yeah. I'm really sorry, but please do continue. Sorry, I'm afraid we're going to have to stop now because we've run out of time. Um, we, we scheduled a break from 12.30 to quarter to, to one, which is only 15 minutes. And I think people will need some lunch before the next session. It's been really fascinating and I'm really glad Roger brought up the issue of, of food because um, it's such a critical issue and I've really enjoyed all the presentations and all the discussions. So thank you really very much, Philippa and everybody. And uh, please come back in, in 15 minutes. Uh, right, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you managed to get some, some lunch. So um, we're now going to have a panel on um, decolonizing and indigenous research methods. Um, I just um, want to thank you all for your presentations earlier. They were so interesting. I think um, just a brief comment while we wait for people to come back. The issue of intellectual property rights that came up. Um, I think what Harriet Kuhnlein said in her video about collective free prior informed consent is really, really critical for ensuring that communities know fully the risks of commercialization um, before they agree to publish or to disseminate um, their knowledge. And there's also the option of them not publishing and then building a knowledge base within communities. And that's something we'll hear about in this session. Um, I also was uh, really enjoyed listening about oral histories and I think they have huge potential at the moment because um, you know the loss of um, traditional knowledge that's going on is often just the elders who have the knowledge and so oral histories are really important to bring back and revitalize biocultural heritage in in the areas we're working you know to try and establish biocultural heritage territories uh, I think archaeobotany um, 
you know, might also help on that if it can help with the recent past, um, <laughs> um, which is kind of more relevant and immediate to communities and might still have um, remnants in the memories of the elders. The session now is, um, is, is a panel of indigenous people on a topic which I think is really important. And as a researcher, I think that the best way um, to help indigenous peoples is to ensure research is led by them, that it empowers indigenous peoples and that it address, addresses their needs and priorities. Um, and this type of research can have a lot more impact in terms of development and environment impact than externally led research. And also there are ethical issues, I think, um, with this externally led research. Um, you know, you're asking indigenous peoples to contribute to a process which generally doesn't give them much benefit in return. So in my view, that's unethical. <laughs> Um, so I think this issue of decolonizing um, research methods is really, really important. And um, I would like to introduce um, uh, Professor Ch Bagele Chilisa. I hope you're here with us. Uh, so um, sh uh, she is a professor at the University of Botswana and her work has focused on, on culturally and contextually responsive research and evaluation and she's written a brilliant book on indigenous research methodologies so welcome and thank you so much Bagele you have 10 minutes oh 10 okay thank yeah. you yeah. Uh, thank you so much thank you for having me um, um, this has been a wonderful uh, time for me I've had a lot of interesting things from all the presenters and now is in this 10 minutes I'm going to share with you uh, uh, what I have so my focus is going to be on uh, indigenous research methodologies and what they are and their benefit to uh, doing research on indigenous, uh, indigenous food. So indigenous research methodologies is about the right of those whose voices have been silenced by Western knowledge to know, to talk, and to be heard. While, for example, in, uh, academics may use historical data, as you have heard over, over the last two days, indigenous people can talk and be heard by using, for example, folklore, stories, taboos about food, oral traditions about food, names of food, songs about food. That is a way to give the indigenous uh, people voice. Of course, the scientists can always uh, do archival data, um, I mean, archeological data and do all the sciences, but indigenous people also have the right to know and they know, and they know through those methods. It is about indigenous people's right to know, to produce knowledge, and own knowledge. In Botswana, when we fry potatoes, we call them French fries. And I think the world over, they are called French fries, even when they are, they are fried in the US. That talks about an indigenous French recipe. Indigenous research methodologies is about bringing indigenous knowledge to the global market, bringing those indigenous recipes to the global market so that they can compete with other recipes. It, has, it is about the right to place indigenous ways of knowing and values at equal footing with other knowledge systems. When we talk indigenous research methodologies, we are therefore talking about mixed methods where mixed methods is not only about combining quantitative and qualitative data, but it is also about 
combining indigenous knowledge, indigenous methods uh, with uh, other conventional methods. So that when we talk of indigenous research methodologies, we're talking about collaborative research. We are talking about multiple methods that recognize indigenous methods. Indigenous knowledge is, a, indigenous research methodologies is about the right of indigenous people to prioritize the research agenda and participate in what is research and to be recognized as core knowledge producers. When you talk about prioritizing, we are, talk, we are talking about the relevant research. Of course, Western researchers have the luxury just to research for curiosity's sake. We indigenous people don't have that. We need research that can benefit us. And it is, uh, it is us who can prioritize what is relevant. Indigenous research is about the resistance to stereotypes and deficit theorizing perpetuated by Western knowledge, Western research, colonial research, the archives, archived knowledge that uh, continue to perpetuate stereotypes. I can understand when indigenous people say, but who wrote those reports? Who wrote those recipes in those books that talk about indigenous people? From what perspective did they write them? Did they write about those recipes as recipes and food? That is not only for eating, but it is also for, for spirituality. It's also for well-being. It is also for connecting people with the environment. When they refuse to say no, not those, you have to understand that they're probably talking from a point of the world views, a point of their own world views. So indigenous research methodologies is not about replacing conventional methods with indigenous uh, uh, research methodologies. It is about a coalition of knowledge systems, a coalition that uh, recognizes other knowledge systems on equal footing. It is about decolonizing the minds of them, indigenous people. You know, indigenous people, they have been brainwashed to think that their foods are inferior. It is therefore about indigenous people appreciating their own heritage. Where, for example, they recognize indigenous recipes, indigenous foods as food that can compete in the global market. Indigenous research methodologies is about carrying out research informed by indigenous worldviews, ways of perceiving reality and value systems. Those marginalized by Western knowledge, for example, can begin by valuing the indigenous food, conducting community research to remind people about the nutritional value of their foods and thus the spiritual healing of the foods. I, I, I happened to uh, listen to a presentation by one of uh, the students who, had, who was uh, talking about food security in part of the country. And one of the things that came out was that 
there were some indigenous foods that could hand, that could stand the vagaries of the climate much much better than those uh, 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 in, uh, crops that have been borrowed from the West. However, the people were not willing to grow indigenous crops because they've been brainwashed to, to think that eating rice is better than eating local food. In research on indigenous foods that, in, that use an indigenous perspective, indigenous methodologies, as I said before, it appreciates the value of food, not only for quenching hunger, but also for spirituality purposes, for connection with the land. An indigenous research worldview recognizes spirituality that is not talked about in Western research. And for you, therefore, it will be appropriate to research on indigenous food using an indigenous worldview that goes beyond Western uh, uh, ways of perceiving reality to indigenous ways of seeing reality, spirituality also as reality. To say that uh, uh, you, uh, research has to respect uh, indigenous values is to talk about eight R's. That is the art of re relationality. This is ethic, ethics. The ethics of research includes relationality, which is doing research that is long lasting. Or you build relationships with the people, not helicopter research where you, where, where, where you get in and get out as quickly as possible. It's about respect. That is respecting the values of the people, respecting their voices, giving them a chance to participate. It's about reciprocity. What is, it, what is this research giving back? This documentation and databases, what are they giving back to the communities? Is it okay to archive those uh, in the form of documents, knowledge that, that, has, that, that the researcher got from the, the communities? Well, the communities are hungry. Researchers can build their names with the research, this and that. But what are you giving back to the communities? It's about responsible research. Responsible research is to say, whose research is it? Who am I for? As a researcher, you always come up with a point of view. You come into the research with a worldview. Whose worldview are you using? Are you looking at the researcher as somebody who doesn't know who you are helping because you can get funding from some sponsor elsewhere? Or are you, are, are, you, are you getting funds so that you can work with the researchers, not for curiosity, not to do research for curiosity, but to do research that is relevant. For us, there is an urgent need for research that addresses our problems, not research for curiosity. Rights of the people to prioritize their research agenda. When you now say you are coming up with this and that, is that your priority as a researcher or is that the priority of the people? Reverence, people are, indigenous people are very spiritual. Do you respect uh, their spirituality? Responsiveness, as you do research, are you able to, to respond to the immediate needs, to the changes as you go along and you do the research or do you use book research where you say, according to uh, 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 this author, 
this is how it has to be done. Therefore, I can't change. I can't do that. I can't do that. Reflexivity. As you do research, do you reflect upon yourself and say, what, uh, what, what, what are the kind of stereotypes and prejudices that I bring into this community? Do you reflect? And lastly, decolonization. The ethics is the ethics when it also decolonizes research. And to decolonize research is to allow other people to speak from their own point of view, their own world views. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Chilisa. That was um, brilliant. Um, those eight R's, I think, are really useful principles for all research. Um, does anybody have any questions? Because we have just a couple of minutes and then we'll move on to the next one. I can't see any questions. Um, yeah. I think we're I all absorbing. Just a, a quick thing. I think, um, yes. you know, she hit the nail uh, on the, there needs to be a reverence to the knowledge that it's being produced because at times, um, you know, this is something that also I, I kind of like talk about that there's food, that it's of nutritional or value that is good for you, but there's like good for your well-being, And that's something important that at times get, get, doesn't come through the research. Um, and especially with, at least I work in the Caribbean and the indigenous communities there are not recognized. So, and there's all these ideas of they were all exterminated during the colonial times. So, there are practices and spiritualities that are still active and also by recognizing them from a research point of view we are also um <clears throat> giving them the agency and the recognition that they deserve outside of their own circles um thank you so much i have one question i am missing one of the r's could we have a list okay um, um, is relationality respect Reciprocity, responsibility, rights, reverence, responsiveness, reflexivity, and decolonization. Thank you so much. I think, you know, you remind us that we all have our own world view. Researchers, they see what, what they see through their own lens. They don't document the spirituality because it's not part of their own culture. So we need to leave our culture behind and step into and see things and be guided by your worldview so that we can do the research properly. But anyway, thank you so much. And um, we'll, we'll have hopefully a bit more time for discussion later, but that was wonderful. I'd like now to pass on to, um, uh, so Florence um, Dagitan, She's from the Philippines and um, to briefly introduce, she is a um, Mayo Kyok Dagitan, um, sorry, Florence Mayo Kyok Dagitan belongs to the Kan Kanai, is one of the seven ethno-linguistic groups known as the Igorots in the Cordillera of the Northern Philippines. And she's going to talk about indigenous methods for research on agri-food systems in the Philippines. She's also working at Teb Teba. Good, good evening, everyone. It's, it's I think, 8 o'clock in our, in our area, so I say good evening or good noon, good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and I thank, I thank also the opportunity for me to speak on our experience. I'm speaking as an indigenous person who has also gone to the academic world, but my my involvement in the research in the search for appropriate research methodologies comes from a being part of a of a people's movement. First, from the advocates of the organic agriculture, sustainable farming, ecological agriculture, agroecology things like that. And then second, as an advocate for the promotion of indigenous people's rights for, for its fulfillment and respect. So from the very start of my work, 
just upon my college days because that was so much activism in the Philippines. That was the time of martial law. We were fortunate enough to be given uh, the correct orientation of working for the people and with the people. So, uh, so we were taught that our people, indigenous peoples in the Cordillera or indigenous peoples uh, of the world, create and produce knowledge from their day-to-day -day life as they relate with their nature and the land. They monitor changes, events, places. They closely observe what is in their surroundings and discover new ways of doing things. And whatever they discover, they share to whoever is interested in the community, like a better way of storing the seeds, the part of the forest where such trees can be found, and others. This knowledge are shared in various ways in different venues, and these are stored in stories, epics, songs, chants, in the memories of our people, but they are shared very uh, or orally. And this, we have this in, in, at present today. So we see that people have been creating knowledge and produ producing knowledge. Yet, when we go to the communities and invite some group to do a research uh, or because we were also told that to, to work in the community, you have to start where the people are. So we have to do the research. But if we invite some groups to do that research with us, then they will say, oh, if it's research, it's not for us. It's for the school people, those who come from the academic or, or who, those who went to the universities. So we see a manifestation of the colonized research in our lands also, uh, uh, even at this time. So the first challenge that we need to transcend is to reiterate that people themselves are doing their own research and creation of knowledge in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, in this event, I would like to share some of the effective indigenous research methods that we have that we that we do to especially in doing research in agri-food systems and when i'm when i was writing this it seems they are very much uh, i think all of you knows this it's just a matter of saying it so one is the mapping or walking through our territory which is the as a, which is the sense of place and identity for us. So in the mapping, some of the many things that we can draw or generate from the mapping exercise or walking through our territories is, are the diversity of the food crops, the different kinds of food crops in the cultivated area. We, we, we can list as many as 40 kinds with each kinds of different varieties. So you see, hundreds of varieties of food crops in our cultivated crops. But we can also see the location of the naturally occurring wild plants and animals that are part of, uh, of the people's diet. How the whole territory contributes to the community's diet. We can also locate the abode of the unseen because these are very important to us they have to have a share of the food. But when you look deeper into it, it has so much a lot to do with the conservation of the species or the regeneration of species. Like one, one belief is that if there is one bamboo shoot, you should not be taking it because it's for the spirits or it's for the unseen. And if you, if you look at that in the scientific language, then you will say, ah, that's for the regeneration so that something will come out again and reproduce itself. And in the sacred sites, where are also the abode of our spirits, uh, you cannot go and hunt there. So it's a sanctuary for the science also. For us, it's abode of the unseen who are our companions in our territory. But I 
thing for scientists. It's the sanctuary of fauna and flora. So they appreciate it very much. But they will say, we are superstitious if we say, we do not go there because it's the boat of the spirit. And in the mapping, we did some upgrading. So we also build their capacity to use the GPS and also to build the 3D map so that then they can always come back to their map and talk about the things that we'd like to talk. The second methodology is the use of traditional calendar. It shows the availability of the food at what time of the year, the time to plant and the time to harvest, the time not to disturb the wild animals in the forest, the fishes in the rice land, the fishes in the rivers, because this is the time for them to mate and reproduce again, and the indicators of changes in the weather. The third methodology is storytelling. It can show certain food, how certain food are valued and why. It can show changes in the consumption and production pattern of our people, how the wilds are protected and how seeds are conserved and how seeds are exchanged. It can, it can show also why we do certain rituals, especially in our rice land, our, every step of our, every stage of the production cycle of the rice land, we do rituals. So then our elders will explain why we have to do those rituals. And then the compare and contrast method. How, commu how community elders and leaders are more proactive in the past than in the present because of the assimilation that is ongoing to us and how they were able to cope with food scarcity and famine. <laughs> the other is, uh, but now we rely on the government. Sometimes we, we forget that we have our own uh, ways of, or our own self-reliance. The other is, the, the other method is the learning by doing when we do innovations in, in our farming system, like production of organic farm inputs. And it, this is the, these are the times that we call, sometimes we call on scientists to help us here, like uh, soil testing of, uh, of soil tests, if we do a production of, we use our resources to produce fertilizers and we also use uh, modern technology and uh, to phase and decomposition, things like that. So we call on the scientists to help us with the laboratory work of if our soils are improving, if the insects are more diverse insect population, and then we also test the traditional indicators. Like for alkaline soil, they say that sour, and for acidic, they say it's, they taste it as bitter. So we can test that in the laboratory. <laughs> it's not validation, but I think it's in also enriching. And then the, you, one of the actual things too is the cooking of traditional crops. Results and outcomes comes even as early as, uh, it depends on what you are researching or studying. But, but the, most, the most essential part is the collective analysis. It's one of the most essential process, which may lead to policy formulation, like comparing and contrasting the food of the past and the present and the health of the children. And then they will say, oh, let's ban the junk food. But it will also have to have a commitment from the women to retrieve the traditional food that they used to have as a snacks, things like that. Uh, yeah, and then it, it can also lead to action like reviving the, our backyard gardens, things like that. For the, those are the things that we do. And then for recommendation, yeah, of course, full and effect, if, if it's an outsider who is coming to our communities, the full and effective participation of the communities should be first ensured. And then, yeah, uh, also indigenous peoples have also come to do their community research and this should be supported and to also build our capacities. 
and uh, mo more important is to I, uh, uh, I think more important is that research should be an educational process for the facilitator and the communities and that the output of research like the knowledge produced should be first should first benefit the community for me also i still find it a uh, an internal conflict on publishing yeah because sometimes uh, funders would like publishing but for me it will not matter if you publish or not but it matters very much that what has the community learned and what action uh, what awareness has been created and what actions have been done because of that research process. And of course, uh, I know also that we uh, indigenous, while we have this uh, yeah, profound wisdom, things like that, but we also have to work with other collaborators. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you so much, Florence. That was really great. And um, it was really interesting to learn about your methods um, about the mapping and so on, storytelling. Um, we have um, a little bit of time if anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment. Um, this is Sanjukta Ghosh from the SOAS South Asia Institute. I'm a historian and researcher on agricultural knowledge. Um, my question is really related to the methods in uh, indigenous knowledge that we just heard. And I was curious to know, you know, who guards these agricultural calendars that you were talking about? Is it still with the elders or is it uh, also something that the young and the women are involved in? Um, and, and how is, you know, the agricultural calendar is again, very uh, based on a very long-term understanding of how seasons work and how crops and animals behave. So, um, I'm just curious how you're building in this whole notion of climate change with a more traditional agricultural calendar that is in place. So are, are these things taken into account when you're changing practices or when you're creating new calendars? Uh, that's just something I had in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Very, thank you for the question. Uh, at present, actually, in, in the areas that I have gone, Climate change is actually uh, in. It does not fit in their calendar, so it's uh, for them also for the for our elders. There's also a uh, uh, because the, when they follow the rice cycle, they have indicators like the coming of certain birds, the flowering of certain crops, and they cannot. Uh, may, many a times they cannot see it anymore. And so, and then also the coming of varieties that those are all those are also taken into consideration. But uh, so, so they say, how do how do we deal? How do they deal with that? But uh, from from the stories that I heard, it says they more and more they do not rely on the the indicators on the changing season but more and more they rely on dreams. So, uh, but, but then also if, uh, because that calendar also synchronizes the activities, right? And it has a lot of to do of labor allocation, pest control management. So our elders are actually grappling with this uh, change, erratic changes in weather and season, uh, yeah. So that's, that's one of the challenge that we need also to have collaborative work with scientists. Great, thank you so much. Is there any other question for Florence or comment? Or other sharing from others? Yeah. I mean, I have to say Florence and, and both and Bagele, so much of what you said resonated with what I know um, from indigenous research methods in, in the Andes, um, in the Potato Park and Maze Park. And there's, there's a lot of similarity um, because I didn't know about, you know, the, the ones, Florence and the Philippines, and, but the, the mapping by walking through the landscape, 
through the territory and um and, and storytelling um and and the, many of the principles that both of you talked about i seem to be quite universal in terms of you know being important for indigenous communities being useful something that's useful directly to you um was emphasized by both of you um right so um i don't know if anybody else wants to make any comment feel free to jump in and just share your thoughts or reactions but that also question when i was talking and now i think also the elders are triangulating like their dreams their the the changes the indicators of seasons and then where the sun strikes in the morning <laughs> Yeah, because these are the, the things that lead them to declare this is the we start the season of planting. Thank you so much, Florence. It was really brilliant. Okay, well, in that case, um, we should probably jump to um, Alejandro's presentation. Um, Alejandro, are you with us? I think I just saw you. Good morning. Good morning. So to introduce Alejandro, um, he is the person who did all the translation for the Potato Park session um, from Quechua to English. He's um, director of programs at the Swift Foundation and he's a board member of Asociación Andes and an indigenous Quechua leader and advisor to the Potato Park and coordinator of INMIP, the International Network of Mountain Indigenous Peoples. And he's going to talk about the decolonizing methodologies that um, the NGO Andes has developed with the Potato Park and the Maze Park communities. Uh, please go ahead, Alejandro. Thank you, Christina. And uh, good morning, everyone, from my side. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to participate in this um, panel um, with so distinguished uh, practitioners and activists and intellectuals, all indigenous. Um, so my greetings. Um, I wanted to share a few slides because um, for us, visuals, dreaming, um, imagining, visioning captures this very intimate um, relationship that we have with time, with the space, and it encapsulates those dreams that we continue to, to have. And uh, the picture you see is well known, it's um, Machu Picchu, but it epitomizes what indigenous research can do. This is the an expression of a holistic approach to how ontologies and epistemologies can produce uh, what we call summa causa or when we bear holistic living. But you picture as a very um, intricate uh, or she also a very intricate relationship between you know um, water management so high knowledge of hydraulics engineering architecture mechanics physics but above all it shows this relationship with a big respect to the environment and i think in a current crisis and all these pressing socioeconomic, political, and ecological challenges that we are uh, facing, this type of knowledge um, it, it has become very important in terms of uh, how we can weave uh, new tomorrows. So, in our part of the world, uh, we are a product of. Um, like you see much much picture is a product of indigenous scholars 
um, looking for uh, reaching this goal of Buen Vivir. So this embodies uh, spirituality, a relationship to the natural world, uh, which is the cornerstone of these conceptions of knowledge, and therefore the purpose of research is established there. And express some principles and values um, we see in our past um, how these ontological and epistemic principles are embedded um, on how our ancestors have passed on knowledge to us <clears throat> and our responsibility to uh, keep evolving, to keep using this knowledge and evolving to uh, respond to challenges of the, uh, the, the future. Key principles here are uh, relationality. Uh, indigenous result, research methodologies is about accountability with the rest of our uh, relations. So it is not just about humans. It is reciprocity that reflects with the, the relationship that we have among all the living elements that um, or living beings including rocks or air or water <clears throat> that um, live within um, this uh, uh, universe of us. And uh, also reciprocity, we call it Aini. It's important in terms of research because it questions this positivistic colonial worldview that research is neutral that we have to only provide prior informed consent uh, as a manner of establishing consensual relationship when the relationship is not between humans only. And um, finally, balance, which is key to sustainability and how we seek to uh, <clears throat> create um, a balanced world within the natural and the human world. Within this, um, as I said, um, we have uh, a, a taxonomy that characterizes this, where we have three communities, three IUs, uh, and our goal is when we be here. Uh, in terms of uh, research methods, um, and learning approaches, um, I just want to um, highlight three of them um, which are key to all the uh, research activities we do. Yachai, which means learning with a mind. Yankai, which means doing and learning with your hands. And Munai, which means learning and doing with a heart. Any type of action has to be uh, <clears throat> carried out or developed within those three tools of learning and action. Now, in terms of decolonizing methods that we apply, participation based in this reciprocal relationship between people and the environment is key to it with the leadership of elders where the knowledge transmission and the participation of youth is key to it. Within this, we uh, continue to um, create tools that go beyond or challenges this colonial view that boxes indigenous research methods and tools within the hermetic borders of convention, conventional qualitative research. We are supposed, uh, according to that view, only able to use um, storytelling, uh, community mapping, uh, legends, oral 
tools that are key to one part of the research. But in our case, uh, in our case, we also use uh, tools that provide the metrics to create um, data, which after can be uh, <clears throat> used uh, to measure and provide numerical um, <clears throat> results that creates a, a, a better approaches to solving local problems. Uh, here you have a, an old drawing of an in command using the kipu, which in this side of the picture we have translated into a molecular kipu, which is the same approach, the same format, but it reflects what is um, what is uh, um, within each one of the variety of potatoes, like in in this case, or this type of uh, a, <clears throat> a ranking different types of values, uh, which we call Yupana, continues to be used by women to rank and give numerical value to different um, uses of medicinal plants of other crops. This also is applied in uh, uh, <clears throat> assessing climate change, for, for instance, here, where we create um, uh, hubs every 100 meters up in the mountain to assess population dynamics, how uh, pests or crops are moving up because of climate change. This provides, again, using the same type of uh, metals and tools, numerical um, <clears throat> results that then we can use to create solutions. This has allowed us uh, to, um, to harbor in the potato, as in the case of the potato park, a large number, one of the largest in the world of uh, uh, potato collection, keep those potatoes, continue to do uh, research in terms of uh, <clears throat> participatory plant breeding, or um, <clears throat> the um, collection of, of uh, these um, uh, uh, varieties that are in danger of disappearing, and its multiplication and transfer to other communities. So the focus of this as was well the focus in the Inca time continued to be, how do we create solutions through food? Also, we apply it to policy, uh, <clears throat> uh, no matter how um, uh, supposedly complicated it is. Um, this is uh, an example of how we <clears throat> uh, um, uh, come into conclusions on an evaluation on uh, CRISPR, uh, this new technology that's flooding many uh, um, uh, research institutions of the world, and being again the you know the silver bullet that's going to uh, create all these changes when we believe that um, what we have within us uh, can be the doors to the future. So to finish, um, uh, I know I, I have like I'm, I'm passing my time. Um, this type of research can be perhaps better um, a, a beyond its, uh, its decolonizing um, uh, focus. Also, it can be um, conceptualized as some type of indigenous mixed method of strategy that combines qualitative and quantitative research practices and responds to this main objective of summa causa, which is the aspiration of our communities. And this, um, as we see in the case of the Kipu or the Yupana, we use the, appro the appropriate theoretical frameworks to transform those old tools into new uh, ways of keep learning and keep creating new knowledge. So um, while 
our research strategy and methods are uh, framed within a colonial and a biocultural history. Um, I think that the principles and values that are inherent to this practice uh, creates also the possibility of new tomorrows and a decolonized uh, research practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. That was fascinating. It, it's um, it's wonderful to hear about the how your research combines the qualitative and quantitative, but all within the use of indigenous principles and worldviews, and for the goal of sumat kausai, which is holistic well-being, or buen vivir. I don't know if anybody would like to ask a question. I realize we have one for the previous, for Florence as well, we can go back to in a minute. But for Alejandro, does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, I, I will then ask one if that's okay. Um, the, the diagram you showed at the beginning, Alejandro, with the, um, the principles that you were talking about, maybe you could explain a little bit where that diagram what it is and where it's from, because I, I think that's fascinating to learn about it for others who don't know. Which one, uh, Christina? The Santa Cruz Pachacuti. Oh, uh, this is the diagram um, that um, 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 was that capture what was um, uh, express as an art, um, a holistic art expression in the most sacred temple of Cusco, the Coricancho, the Golden Temple. And uh, this uh, conceptual graphic, um, uh, you know, this drawing came from a, an Indian chronicler who uh, was able to translated into this conceptual graphic uh, in the mid 1500s after um, you know um, your um, I mean the, uh, um, the Europeans arrived in, um, in Cusco and um, it um, basically uh, captures our you know space our ontology our universe where we conceptualize three communities that interact, reciprocate, and try to work together towards achieving summa causa. And those communities are the human community or the runa, which includes everything that um, is, uh, nurtures human and humans nurture and reciprocity. So domesticated crops, animals, water, uh, anything that lives around humans is considered runa. The other realm is the salja or the wild. So anything that uh, <clears throat> has its own uh, world, um, like a wild biodiversity, wild water, wild wind, whatever humans don't have control, it has its own community. And the third one, which is the critical one, is the Auki, which reflects our um, uh, connection with the sacred. That's where our ancestors and the sacred principles that define the epistemological architecture of knowledge um, uh, are um, embedded. So these three communities have to work together have, um, and the way of communicating and seeking balances through the sacred uh, principle of reciprocity or Aini. And once that balance is achieved, we have reached Summa Causa. So could you show it to us briefly so people know which one you're talking about, please? Um, I was referring to this, to this where um, you have this old drawing of Santa Cruz uh, Pachacuti. And uh, you know, if you see 
uh, the middle star, that's the Southern Cross, which in most indigenous uh, traditions is a sacred symbol because it connects the sacred with the human world. It connects the, um, you know, we call it Chacana. It's like a bridge. It bridge all types of epistemologies and, you know, um, generations and, and, you know, different types of conceiving the world. So it's the key of diversity. And with that, we have the Aukiayu, which is the sacred, the Salha Ayu, uh, which is the wild, and the Runa Ayu, the, the human realm. And when there is reciprocity, as I said, um, we achieve Summa Causa. So, uh, you know, this uh, uh, paradigm, this concept of Summa Causa, of course, go beyond this idea of sustainability where, um, you know, the economical uh, interest or, or it's viewed upon an, an architecture that's, that keeps um, pushing this capitalist uh, 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 worldview of Western, the Western world uh, to the infinite. How we keep destroying nature without destroying. That's what sustainability means in terms of, uh, uh, I think, Western mind. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we uh, kind of challenge that with this uh, paradigm uh, <clears throat> um, where uh, the ethical aspects of research, uh, which are embedded in the spiritual values of indigenous peoples are strongly reflected in the Aoki Aiju. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot for explaining that. So the, the old diagram from this Inca chronicler in, in the 1500s now guides their, their research, which is led by community researchers from each community in the Potato Park. And um, it's very much um, about traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge transmission, transmitting the values and transmitting the knowledge between elders and youth through the research process, as Alejandro mentioned at the beginning. So it's a way of, you know, really revitalizing these cultural values and biocultural heritage using these sort of ancient principles uh, from the Incas, um, which I think is a really nice um, example, which I haven't seen others do, but um, I would love to find similar, um, you know, graphics and principles and concepts for other indigenous peoples. I think it would really help in revitalizing biocultural heritage. Does anybody, uh, would anybody like to share any reflections with Alejandro? If not, we can go back to Florence's um, question. Okay. So, um, okay. I mean, if, if people want to continue um, you know, want to comment on your presentation. Anybody want to? Don't be shy. Okay, we can always come back to Alejandro and to Bagele in the conversation, but for now I'm going to um, look at this question for Florence. Um, uh, Panilla, would you like to say your question? Are you still with us? Okay, I'll read it out. Uh, thank you, Florence, for the rich presentation. When you refer to the elders' triangulation, I also see we can add the very long timeline they have to build their experiences on. They have observed and interacting with their landscape for so long and with so many perspectives. So it can never be com compensated with other methods from science, which is in the best case study, one, one fact, facto in long time series, but many times represents a snapshot in one dimension. Okay, so it's a comment. And Panilla, would you please um, explain that if you're still with us? Because I didn't fully understand it. But I think Pernilla is trying to say that uh, because I mentioned that uh, in the age of, uh, yeah, on the triangulation, I will start first with that. Because in the, in, in our, when we do our research, we found out that the, when they declare the season to uh, one season to start 
they make use of uh, when does the, some would there are places where at the at the first break of the of the sunrise the sun strikes somewhere and another is the, the the indicators in the change in weather around the surroundings and another is their dream so that now we only hear that they more rely on dreams because uh, changes are happening and some of the indicators have disappeared and <clears throat> and also that uh, of, of course yeah something like that but what i what i understood from pernilia is that uh, because i mentioned that with the age of with this change in climate and erratic weather condition we may need also support to hasten the knowledge development on how we are going to appropriate our our calendar in the changing times and so i think pernilia is saying that we may not be needing other knowledge system because the, our elders are there that's what i got from her comment right okay thank you very much um i wonder if um something i i thought might be really relevant to others is to understand a bit better um more specifically your methods of research alejandro so the capacity building workshop workshops for the um indigenous research experts and then the the app that you use for them to collect the data and that goes straight to a database I and mean, you can explain all this much better but we've been talking a little bit about documenting knowledge and databases and how to build a knowledge base in communities so maybe you could explain your methodology on that aspect please yeah me how to um, integrate metrics and make uh, measurements that reflect better or more accurate how um, you know uh, we conceptualize the uh, our own universe in terms of its relationality uh, everything is connected to everything so you cannot do research um, which is um, you know books and some type of speciality um, and how the results of um, you know this type of um, holistic approach or integrative approach where you have mixed methods working all the time uh, can be captured and stored so um, we had um, de developed a process by which uh, we tried in the first instance to combine the collection methods in terms of the qualitative and quantitative approaches um, without making uh, these type of distinctions, but rather looking the needs of particular phenomena that we may be interested in learning or uh, solving. Once we have uh, the tools that are uh, um, uh, decided to uh, gather information, then um, we have created uh, ways, visual ways of um, <clears throat> capturing that type of information, which includes the use uh, um, now of an application that we have developed in-house that takes advantage of uh, the visuals that um, a, uh, um, a, you know, an, a, um, a phone uh, or a tablet these days may offer, like video, uh, photograph, uh, GPS for mapping. Uh, so, uh, and uh, re voice recording. So those are also, um, you know, tools that um, you would use in traditional knowledge uh, transmission within within this context. So we we use those, uh, but frame within an app for a tablet, by which we 
start gathering information uh, and then selecting them in what we call um, a biocultural database. Once database, it's uh, when this is uh, stored in the database, then uh, as you've seen in the pictures, the um, um, the um, uh, our elders get together in knowledge circles, um, and they start analyzing the data by use of graphics. Um, this is then tabulated into into boxes, as you see in the Yupana, which is kind of a, a Chinese abacus. Uh, the way we use um, these boxes, um, you know, a matrix, uh, and the ranking numerical ranking is done by using grains of mice. That uh, <clears throat> that provides, um, you know. A, uh, the numerical data that we are looking and which is then uh, translated into uh, <clears throat> into um, you know uh, uh, back into the database and then we mix it uh, with the help of uh, you know um, uh, <clears throat> already existing programs for uh, research um, like I survey or orders from which we have borrowed the methodology and we can do uh, the analytical um, measurements uh, and arrive to some conclusions. Those conclusions go into another meeting of elders and youth who uh, then um, analyze the, the resulting information to type the best decisions in terms of which of those um, or how to apply that information in solving problems. It could be a pest uh, or a disease in a crop. It could be soil fertility. It could be water management. It could be policy. So um, the matrix idea that the, uh, our ancestors of Incas use or the matrix tool that our ancestor Incas used to use, you know, they, um, of course, they, um, they um, allow us to, um, to um, um, create this, um, this type of, um, of approach, um, of, uh, I mean, of process. Um, and then once it's, um, uh, the decision is made, then the community assembly sanctions and becomes part of a life plan. So it's included in, in a long-term plan, which uh, the local authorities have the obligation to implement. So that's more or less the, how we combine, you know, uh, our old tools um, borrow from, um, from modern tools uh, <clears throat> the mechanics of doing it and produce results that can be useful to particular um, situations or, or problem solving that are more localized. I don't know if that uh, responds to question, Christina. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, maybe I'll just add to clarify um, because I, I, I know about the transect use and in the, in the Maze Park, they've been doing transects walking through the landscape using um, you know, smartphones with this app and the elder um, or, or community um, researcher and the youth and uh, maybe a staff from the local NGO, a scientist, they walk together and there's probably more people from the communities. And in that way, they can do a transect looking at the plants with the elders talking about their uses and the knowledge being transferred to the youth and the 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 plant being having a botan botanical name and that goes in as they walk at, to see each plant they have a discussion sharing knowledge and they take a picture and they put the information in and they collect information about um, medicinal and nutritious wild plants and that's all gone straight into their community database um, so anyway, I just thought um, trying to give it uh, some practical 
um, example of how it's used. Right, well, we're coming close to the end. Um, we, we still have a few minutes of discussion. Um, I, I put a question in the agenda. Um, how can interdisciplinary methods be used in a decolonizing participatory action research framework? I don't know if anybody um, wants to comment on that. I guess we've heard about lots of um, interdisciplinary methods, ethnobotany, we've heard about um, archaeobotany, um, and we've heard about oral histories. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to reflect or comment on their usefulness for um, indigenous led research. Christina, if I may, I, do you allow me? Yes, go ahead, please. Um, I think uh, uh, what you have said is um, very important, but it's part of the whole picture. You know, um, we are reducing this discussion to uh, the practice of research in the field where you have to be respectful, you have to follow private informed consent um, and try to support the local movement in terms of decolonizing processes. But that de decolonizing must also happen in research institutions. If you see many of the institutions out there uh, that do uh, this type of research, uh, you know, they don't have any indigenous academic or researchers in their uh, staff. Or, you know, research is done in a way that it's cheap to hire indigenous researchers in the country of origin uh, you know, and uh, do this and present it as a participatory. I hope the participatory also can include the salaries so that this is the same type of recognition goes to researchers, indigenous researchers, as um, at the same, uh, you know, balancing with uh, those of academics. Also, the lack of indigenous researchers to actually guide, you know, this transformative approach, decolonizing approach uh, <clears throat> in these institutions um, everywhere in the world, it needs to be complemented, you know, with a devolution of mat genetic material, cultural material that was misappropriated, that was pillaged, you know, from indigenous lands in colonial times and is, you know, long overdue that uh, seeds, medicinal plants, ornamentals, trees go back to the communities of origin uh, and stop being, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> misused and utilized through patents and all types of uh, <clears throat> commodifying methods in, you know, Western institutions, uh, or what we feel it's sacred uh, and it's exhibit as a trophies of war in museums and other institutions must be devolved to indigenous, um, you know, quarters. So, I think that this discussion on decolonizing research also takes into account this other side of uh, the coin where colonial attitudes, racist, white supremacy in research continues to be very strong and it's not changing. So it's just like a, a reflection uh, on on your previous comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Alejandro. I um, fully agree with what you're saying. Um, I have two questions. Uh, I think Julian, would you like to say something? Julian Garay? Yeah. Um, so actually was a, a question on this aspect of decolonizing for Alejandro, because I see that the, um, there's a use of historical text and um, of 
European colonial text and in, of the colonization. And I, I wonder, because we have also a lot of the Caribbean, um, but the question is how do you make the decision of actually what, you know, decolonizing that narrative from those texts? How can, how does, how, what is the process that the community makes to actually like, oh, this is what we're gonna take from this? <clears throat> I think that's, uh, uh, you know, defined by uh, the specificity of what the community considers to be a uh, priority in terms of solving problems. You know, uh, it could be, um, you know, um, uh, as in our case, um, uh, climate change and uh, particularly in mountain ecosystems uh, in the Andes is one of the, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, existential threats that we have. All the crops are moving very fast up in the mountain. Uh, most of our crops are just, uh, you know, at the top. And uh, we are very sure that we're going to lose um, not just the crop, but also, uh, you know, uh, complete seed um, seed and food systems. So in that case, like uh, uh, everybody agrees that whatever effort we make into learning, creating knowledge, uh, organizing information to solve those problems must be focused on that type of, um, on that type of uh, have, um, problem solving. Um, and then once we have, uh, you know, the, the objective of what we want to do, then we go into what we have, you know, and I think uh, in our case, because, uh, you know, we have a long history uh, in terms of uh, having created a relationship with environment and tribe on it in a very organic manner. Uh, that means that we have applied science and technology uh, in the past, uh, you know, for the benefit of all relations, the benefit not just of humans, but, but the benefit of all. So uh, what type of tools do we use to keep, uh, you know, focusing on that, focusing on that, uh, you know, holism, focusing on, on that type of balance and uh, interaction uh, that would create, uh, you know, um, um, a, a, a new tomorrow. So then we, pay, we, we choose the different tools, be it from the past or, or present or combined. And that's why we, we, we resolve the question. So I guess in each context, it's going to be different. Well, thank you, Alejandro. I, I'm afraid we've got, well, we're, we're meant to be finishing in two minutes, but if it's okay, we could stay for another five minutes as people want to ask questions. Uh, Yu Ching Song wants to say something. Go ahead, Yu Ching. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for all the contributors. Uh, Alejandro's uh, presentation about the bicultural, uh, uh, by culture of a uh, uh, heritage framework really remind me of our uh, spiritual leader, G, uh, leader Ji Xianhe. He attended uh, uh, the day before yesterday that uh, he, pre he presented about uh, the uh, their community's uh, uh, by culture part, uh, like uh, uh, form into four part: uh, culture, uh, physical, which is the uh, eco, eco biodiversity part uh, and the community part. And uh, he described that uh, exactly like uh, Alejandro described. It is a uh, cultural spirit as a base, as a core. And uh, it is a live and organic process interacted within the community and among the commu uh, other communities and with the outside world. And it's a live uh, process, evolution process. So I think that uh, uh, if we're talking about uh, decolonizing research, the first thing we need to do is that we really need to uh, understand them, learning from them. In, in order to realize that, we really need to be, follow the community-based action research and uh, touch to the ground, uh, working together with them. And rather, otherwise, we, we, cannot, we cannot understand the whole it's a whole world, it's a whole complex, uh, complexity, alive, organic world. 
It's not like a science, it's just a part and a piece. One speciality in one part. We really need to understand the linkage, the whole systems. If we not with them, we, we have no idea. So that's what I want to add up. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Yi Ching. Uh, Zhou Zhi, you wanted to make a comment? Please go ahead. Yes, there is a thread in the discussion about um, what can be recovered, for example, from colonial archives or history and material written by the outsider, right? Now, in the Cordillera, we had to write our own history because uh, the books that are, uh, that are used in the schools were all colonial history, right? However, we had a very strong uh, supporter who was a historian, and he's, uh, he's an American scholar, actually. And he wrote um, Crux Through the Parchment Curtain, right? And what he did was to actually use all of the historical uh, archives, but using historical research to understand and interpret what was actually happening in the, on the land at that time, right? And that material that he has written, including his other historical writing, became the, uh, supplemented a lot the material that the students and the researchers, the indigenous researchers, used to write our own history of the Cordillera. So there really is a lot of material that can be interpreted in our own way that is uh, uh, in the colonial archives. For example, when even in, this is not just in the Philippines, for example, in Molucas, when they needed their maps to uh, record their customary systems, they had to go back to the Dutch uh, libraries <laughs> to get that, right? So um, there is a way of there is another aspect of decolonization of those colonial institutions. And I think they are starting to take the steps wherein um, that history is um, understood and uh, owned and appropriated for us to make our own uh, story. And I think uh, this is one of the strands that has gone through the, the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shoji. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time now. It's been great discussion. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm not gonna summarize everything, but just to say, um, yeah, I, I think this issue that Alejandro raised about the repatriation is um, you know, really important one. And we've seen how in the potato park, repatriation of, of native potatoes has brought back, revived indigenous knowledge and culture and um, you know, created a genetic reserve that's important for the, for the whole world. And there's a lot of um, seeds uh, that, that indigenous communities have lost and that are sitting in, in gene banks, um, you know, and they could be being used and, and used for, for climate adaptation and, and being protected in nature. Um, so that's a really important issue. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much to Alejandro and to Bagele Chilisa and to Florence Dagitan for your great presentations. I've learned so much from you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the presenters this morning. And um, just to close really a few, a few um, things that we've learned um, in the last four webinars. Um, we've learned that indigenous food systems play a critical role in achieving SDG2 um, and in feeding humanity in a sustainable way in future in the longer term and a resilient, in a resilient way not only to climate change, but to COVID-19, and also in a compassionate way uh, because of the solidarity values. Um, whereas under the current food system, we're seeing growing food insecurity and hunger. And so indigenous food systems provide critical lessons for transitions to more sustainable and equitable food systems. Um, we've heard very strongly today that research must address indigenous people's priorities and the many challenges facing indigenous food systems and this is urgent because we are losing traditional knowledge we're losing crops we're losing culture very fast and research must also address the unequal power relations between researchers and indigenous peoples 
and be empowering towards indigenous peoples and give them a voice and recognize them as experts who have ancestral wisdom that offers valuable pathways towards sustainable and equitable development. So uh, finally, um, on terms of the next steps, um, we're going to uh, circulate um, the workshop report and use the outputs to inform various policy meetings. Um, I know this hasn't been a perfect forum for networking, but I hope it's, you will follow up on contacts that you've made. Um, I'm really grateful for all of your inputs, all of the indigenous peoples, all of the universities, the FAO and IID partners, we need to continue working together. Um, and finally, um, uh, a huge thanks to all the indigenous experts and speakers from universities. Um, and a huge thanks to Philippa Ryan from Q, um, who we're uh, doing this workshop with and, and the uh, AHRC project. And a huge thanks to the IID support team, to Matt Wright and Alistair, who have provided great technical support and to Beth Down um, at IIED. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I've learned so much from you. I um, hope we can continue the conversation and we'll probably send a short survey if you, if you wouldn't mind. Anyway, I'm sorry about the distance and the, um, that we can't actually see each other, but um, thanks a lot for all the learning. Goodbye. <laughs> okay, goodbye.